Done. The Community legal member for Isaac play a will resume his seat in accordance with Standing Order 43. The time for members' statements has concluded. The Prime Minister on indulgence. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister for Justice and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Counterterrorism will be absent from question time this week while he attends a number of conferences in Europe with French, German and United Kingdom counterparts to strengthen security ties and discuss further opportunities for law enforcement, cooperation and intelligence sharing. Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs will answer questions on his behalf. I thank the Prime Minister. Questions without notice. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, we already know that the budget is scheduled for the 10th of May. Is that the date the Treasurer will actually deliver it? The Treasurer has Speaker, called. I thank the member for his question. The budget on the 10th of May, and it's going to be a very important budget, Mr Speaker, because it's going to be a budget. It's going to be a budget that is all about supporting Australians and backing them in to make this successful transition in our economy, Mr Speaker. The transitioning of our economy is the most important challenge facing the country economically, Mr Speaker. And the way we're going to meet that challenge is by backing investment, Mr Speaker, and ensure that the investment that drives jobs, Mr Speaker, the investment that drives growth can be supported through the budget measures of this government. Now, those opposite, Mr Speaker, they have a very different plan. Their plan is to chase higher and higher levels of spending with higher and higher levels of taxes, Mr Speaker. Their plan is to tax investment, Mr Speaker, at a time when we need to be ensuring that the investment will flow so the growth will flow, Mr Speaker, and so the jobs will flow. And that will be the focus of the budget on May 10. The member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister advise the House of the need to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act to ensure that both uh, Houses of Parliament reflect, ref, reflect and respect the will of the people? The Prime Minister. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his question. Mr Speaker, there is nothing more important than that the voting system that we use to elect this House and the Senate translate as effectively and accurately as possible the wishes of the Australian people. And so where Australians are entitled to expect that when they vote for the Senate, the outcomes will reflect their choice. And Mr Speaker, that's why the government has introduced legislation to reform the Senate's voting system. They will simplify the ballot paper and stop the gaming of the system by preference whisperers and backroom deals. Mr Speaker, we know that what has been happening with the Senate voting system has been anything but democratic and anything but transparent. The reality is that dozens of micro parties were established, group voting tickets were filed and negotiated, in some cases three per party. Voters had no idea where their preferences were going to go, and in reality, Mr Speaker, the outcome of many of those Senate uh, races of many of the outcomes of the Senate election did not fairly reflect the wishes of the people. The only solution is to ensure that the Australian people have the choice that they make and that they decide where their preferences go. Now, this was not until recently a controversial matter, Mr Speaker. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, as we know, had unanimously recommended changes to the voting system. And consistent with those recommendations, our reforms will deliver just that transparency. Uh, as honourable members know, the member for Brand, uh, Gary Gray, said in this place on 12 May last year it would be a travesty for Australian democracy if these careful and thought through reforms were not in place in time for the next federal election. These reforms will significantly strengthen our democratic process. Labor was 100 per cent committed to these reforms until it suited in a cynical and hypocritical exercise of political gamesmanship. It suited them to change their mind. Mr Speaker, the reforms will ensure that there will be optional preferential voting above the line, with advice to voters to number one to six, at least in the order of their choice, but if they number uh, less than six but at least one, the vote will still be valid. And so that's a good saving provision to ensure there is not, that doesn't result in, in informal votes. Uh, optional preferential voting below the line will be established with advice to number at least 12 of the boxes in the order of the voters' choice. 
group and individual voting tickets will be abolished. Who will succeed? Who will win out of this? The voter. The voter will make the decision, and their decision will be reflected in the composition of the Senate. Just before I call the Leader of the Opposition, the members for Bendigo, Wakefield, Parramatta and Morton were consistently interjecting. They'll cease interjecting if they want to remain in the chamber. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister has made a deal with the Greens political party to change the Senate voting rules so that if he wins the election he can force absolutely anything he wants through the parliament, just like John Howard did with work choices? Isn't this part of the government's plan to force through measures from the 2014 budget which are still listed in the Senate? The mem members on my right will cease interjecting. The members for Bass and Lyons and Deakin. The Prime Minister has the call. Mm. Well, well, Mr Speaker, uh, th thank you. I thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for his question. And I'm, uh, I have to say, Mr Speaker, I'm surprised after such a stirring address at the National Press Club uh, when he talked about uh, unemployment and uh, the economy that uh, we may have got a question on that. But it's extraordinary. Uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition has such a short a short attention span, Mr Speaker. In the time it took him to get from the press club to the House of Representatives, he's forgotten all the economic issues he was talking about earlier. Mr Speaker, the, the Leader of the Opposition's question is no more than a rather miserable conspiracy theory. He knows full well that the reason we are supporting the reform of the Senate voting system is precisely the reason he and his party supported it until very recently. It's precisely the reason the member for Brand still supports it, because the member for Brand knows, and the Labor Party knew until and they still know, but they choose not to say it anymore. They know full well that the system has been gamed, and it did not and does not accurately or fairly reflect the will of the people. And our job is to ensure that the dysfunction in the Senate ends and that every member of the Senate can say that they have been the result of a, of a considered decision by the Australian people voting collectively. And that means that Australian voters should, should choose the preferences. They should determine how votes are cast, not backroom deals and preference whisperers, who until very recently the Labor Party used to condemn. And it says a lot, Mr Speaker about the shameful cynicism of the Leader of the Opposition, that until recently—and I say this with, with great respect to the former chairman of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters—there was no more eloquent advocate of Senate voting reform than the member for Brand. I mean, he, 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 was, he was committed to it. He explained it. He's a former General Secretary of the Labor Party. He understood it perfectly, and he understood the importance that the parliament is seen to work, the parliament does work, and it is seen to represent the will of the people. And so that's why he advocated those changes. That's why we all advocated them. That's why everybody supported them. Until now, in this very cynical switch, the Labor Party is opposing them. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition should seek to find, go back to his better nature, and support these changes to the Senate voting system in the Senate today. The member for Parramatta will cease interjecting. The member for Hindmarsh has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government is successfully managing the transition from the resources boom to a new, stronger and more diverse economy? Yeah. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, last week uh, in South Australia we saw a lot of evidence of the type of investment and innovation that is going to make ensure the member for that our, Australians, is warned he our will not children use and grandchildren have the great high-wage jobs of the 21st century. Mr Speaker, our priority is to ensure that the Australian economy continues its successful transition from one that was driven by a mining construction boom an enormous and very welcome mining construction boom to one that seizes the opportunities of these the most exciting times in human history. We have never before seen such global economic growth in both scale and pace. 
supercharged by technology, the opportunities have never been greater. But to succeed in seizing those opportunities, Mr Speaker, to continue that successful transition which we are experiencing, <clears throat> we need to be more innovative, more competitive and more productive. So every lever of government policy is pulling in that direction. Our innovation agenda represents a $1.1 billion investment to ensure that Australian children acquire the digital skills and literacy of the 21st century, that our great academic scientists and researchers collaborate better with industry, and that investment and entrepreneurship is encouraged. And earlier today, Mr Speaker, together with the Minister, we announced the composition of the new Board of Innovation and Science Australia, composed of academics, business leaders, entrepreneurs. That is the team that will help us lead our science and innovation agenda and deliver the industry and the jobs of the future. And those same priorities, Mr Speaker, drive the government's defence white paper. We need to ensure that our defence dollar not only strengthens our armed forces in terms of the acquisition of new capabilities, but also serves to build up and expand our local defence industries, from big manufacturers to technology start-ups. And in South Australia last week, Member for Wakefield Speaker, will leave under 94 we visited Fugro Laser Airborne Depth Sounding, an Australian technology developed for originally for the Navy immediately. and now exported right around the world. Defence technologies lead the way. The member in for Wakefield will leave immediately, or I'll take more severe action. <coughs> the Prime Minister will resume his seat. I warn all members, when they're asked to leave under 94A, it's a requirement to leave immediately. There's been a couple of instances in or well, this year where members have deliberately lingered. I'm giving fair warning. A persistence of this will lead to a naming. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Australian economy is strong, resilient, and innovative, and we are transitioning well. In the, in the December quarter, we saw real GDP grow by 3 per cent from a year earlier. Our annual growth faster than any of the G7 economies. 300,000 new jobs created last year, the strongest growth since 2006. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing strong growth strong progress, but we the need continued Prime innovation to support it. Has expired. The Leader of the Minister. Opposition. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister is changing the Senate voting rules so that if he wins the next election, he can ensure that students will be paying $100,000 degrees? When will the Prime Minister stop being tricky? and be up front with the Australian people about his plans for the Senate. M members on my right will cease interjecting. Members on my right, the members for Karangamite, the Minister for Resources, will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, well thank you, Mr Speaker. The, uh, the, the, leader, the Leader of the Opposition's conspiracy theory knows no bounds. Apparently, the, uh, according to his conspiracy theory, uh, the, the only reason the government is supporting Senate voting reforms is because of all of these consequences listed. Presumably that was the reason his party supported Senate voting reforms until only a few weeks ago. Mr Speaker, we were all on a unity ticket until very recently. And now, of course, now because it doesn't suit his immediate uh, political objectives, he's decided to go against it. The real problem for the Leader of the Opposition is how can he reconcile the strong position that was taken by the Labor Party formally before the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that was advocated day in, day out by his shadow spokesman, the, the member for Brand, advocating that day after day, making the case in this chamber, on the radio, on the television, and now suddenly he's pulled the rug out from under the member for Brand because it doesn't suit his purposes any longer. Even, even the member for Gorton, I noticed, on the radio, on the on Sky News, I should say, Mr. Speaker was asked today to concede whether the uh, changes in the Senate uh, would make the would be an improvement, and he said, "Well, they could be better, but it's being thrust upon the Parliament." He complained it was being thrust upon the Parliament. The Electoral Matters Committee, I think, reported in 2014, and a year ago, year ago, the government was being the government was being uh, chastised by the member for Brand for not getting on with the job, Mr. Speaker. Really. 
the Leader of the Opposition has got to do better than this. If he is interested in the big issues confronting the Australian economy, he should ask, should be asking we, why, why his policies are so destructive of jobs and investment. Why? Why is he proposing to increase capital gains tax right at the time when we need more investment? Why is he proposing a set of policies that will lower house prices, increase rents and reduce entrepreneurship? He talks about, he talks about jobs. He talks about jobs. Every policy that he has announced to date is calculated to reduce business activity and reduce employment. Do you really think, do we really think that we're going to see more jobs in the construction industry, for example, if, 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 we, if we take no steps about the CFMEU's disregard for the law? Apparently, apparently, that, apparently the law isn't important in terms of the construction industry. And of course, by reducing the value of housing, by reducing the value of housing, he feels that's going to encourage more construction. Really, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the lack of understanding of the dire consequences of their policies is marked. The Labor Party does not understand the economy, and if they're given a chance to lead it, the they'll put it at Prime great risk. The Prime Minister's time has expired. The member for Fairfax has the call. A question to the Treasurer. The average Australian family contributes around $20,000 a year to superannuation. A large percentage of Australians will be dead before they're eligible to use the money, Treasurer. Will the government allow Australians the right to access part of their super to buy a home or to support their family in difficult times? What's the point of slaving for 50 years to never enjoy the benefits of your own hard work? The Treasurer has the call. <laughs> Members on my right, the member for Deakin will cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question, and I'm sure he's equally concerned about those who are mm -hmm. uh, at the Queensland Nickel plant, uh, where he's had some involvement in, in recent times, and I'm sure he must be very concerned about their entitlements and, and their future. I know that I, I know that our member is. Uh, I think I know our member for Herbert is very concerned about those Queensland Nickel workers, and I want to commend the member for Herbert for his outstanding work on their behalf. And uh, I, I commend those on this side of the House, particularly the Minister for Employment, who's committed some two and a half million dollars to support the transition for those workers who will be affected uh, by that plant, uh, which the member has had some considerable involvement with. But the member asked me about issues of superannuation, and this government has been engaged in a process of ensuring that we have a retirement income system that is fit for purpose <coughs> for the 21st century. In last year's budget, Mr. Speaker, in last year's budget, what we did is we changed arrangements around the pension to make sure it was fit for purpose that would ensure that those uh, who are on a pension, who are on low assets, would actually get more support and those who are in a better position to support themselves with higher assets would no longer be become dependent on a part pension. Now, Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister took up office, um, he put the second phase of retirement incomes review really on that agenda, and the government has been working through the issues around superannuation. Now, the Assistant Treasurer uh, last week outlined in response to the Murray review that our superannuation system has to be fit for the purpose of ensuring that people are not dependent on a pension or a part pension as much as possible. And how you frame your changes to superannuation are about that purpose. About that purpose. Now those opposite have a plan to tax superannuation for no other reason than to raise revenue to chase high levels of spending, Mr Speaker. That's their plan on superannuation, just to tax it. There's, there's no plan in there to make superannuation better. There's no plan in there to make superannuation more flexible or to offer more choice. In fact, those opposite oppose choice Member in superannuation, Mr Speaker. Those opposite oppose uh, someone in their own employment in cases choosing their own fund into which their superation will go, Mr Speaker. Those opposite oppose the idea of having better governance of superannuation funds, Mr Speaker, and they oppose it. This side of the House is focused on delivering superannuation changes that are fairer, that are more flexible, that offer more choice, Mr Speaker. And that's what the government is working on. And we will continue to do that up to the budget, Mr Speaker, and we will make those announcements at the appropriate time. But superannuation is there to support those Australians, the incentives that are provided to ensure that those who are at risk of being on a welfare payment, on a pension or on a part pension in their retirement can avoid being in that position. And that's what the government's measures will be designed to do. Just before I call the member for Page, I'd just like to advise the House we have present in the gallery 
this afternoon, former member of this House, Mr Barry Hass. Welcome back. The member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government's policies are facilitating jobs and investment in agriculture? How is the delivery of these policies restoring agriculture as a fundamental pillar of the Australian economy? The Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And it is uh, absolutely apparent that the most important thing in so much of regional Australia is jobs. Throughout Australia, it's about jobs. It's about making sure that we facilitate, we bring about an economy that brings stronger jobs growth. And we on this side absolutely believe in that stronger jobs growth. And we've seen it, Mr Speaker, in the member's own seat in Page, and we've seen it in the, that, in the, the town of Tabulum and near the Aboriginal community of Jubilum that we have uh, the expansion of Ridley Bell's blueberry farm, 600, 600 new jobs, 600 new jobs in an area where there wasn't employment in the past and, and where we are driving that employment factor forward because we believe that it's so vitally important that we give people the opportunity of a good job. In, within the, uh, in the area, we also have 22 full-time equivalent positions going into the warehousing. It's all about driving this agenda, and it's not just there, not just round tabulum, but it's also making sure that uh, around Costas Group, uh, their new uh, tomato factory at Gyra, that we also bring forward new jobs as well. With their expansion up there, we have 170 new jobs into that area. 170 new jobs uh, for the people at Gyra, and this means that the town is going ahead. And, also, and if we go down, I know the Labor left. Party is not very interested in jobs. But at Thomas Foods, we also have further jobs. Thomas Foods at Tamworth, we have new jobs going in there with the expansion. 200 new jobs at Tamworth, and this is vitally important. To the north of the area, we see that in Toowoomba, with the uh, new airport that's been put in by the Wagner brothers, that we have, further, we have further facilitated the growth of further jobs in that area, especially in the horticultural industry. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's quite apparent that our belief in making sure that we get new jobs is based on our knowledge of the areas. And Mr Speaker, um, I was also uh, very uh, pleased to see that the Labor Party, the Labor Party too, it's good to see that you're referring to your old colleague, the Labor Party too, the Labor Party too, has had, has had a survey to see if they're interested in jobs. To see if they're interested in the jobs for, and they had the candidates for Page and Richmond. And how do they spell Page? P-A-I-G-E. Page and Richmond. Sounds like a wonderful young couple down at the surf club. A wonderful young couple down at the surf club. They can't even get the name of the seat right. This, this, this is how ridiculous it is. This is how ridiculous it is that they would put on a forum. And who, and who, was, the, who, was, the, who was the grand light of that forum? Well, it was you. It was Bill Shorten. Bill Shorten. And he doesn't. So I wish to table. I wish to table, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the community town hall forum at a, at a seat we've never even heard about, the seat of Payage. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Treasurer in his last answer and the Prime Minister have been deeply critical of the member for Fairfax's actions in relation to Queensland Nickel. The Prime Minister said the member for Fairfax had let down the workers and the only thing the Prime Minister was concerned about was that the workers were looked after. So why, according to reports, did the Prime Minister receive $50,000 monthly payments from PlayUp while PlayUp workers weren't being paid? Hasn't the Prime Minister let down the workers at PlayUp? The Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Mr. I'm not going to dignify that question with an answer. Members on the, my left, the, the, the honourable member knows the honourable member knows full well that that question has nothing at all to do with my responsibilities as Prime Minister and relates 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 to a commercial transaction which I might say was quite misreported in the Australian Financial Review. But I will. But I will. I will, on this occasion, address this, address this matter. The, the facts of the matter are these. And I'll say this is, this is not members a matter not, within my responsibility as Prime interject. Minister, but I will but I'll address the matter nonetheless, given that the member has raised it. The, when, I was, uh, when we were in opposition, I invested 
you know, my wife and I invested in a company called Revo, which had an online business. It's a, a, you know, a startup technology company. When I became that's not correct. When I became uh, a minister, I sought to sell the shares in the company. The company is a private company. The co was the company's request. The shares were sold at their request to another, an entity associated with it, uh, called Revo Nominees, and that was the and there was a, the purchase price that was to be paid in 12 months or when a capital raising had been completed, whichever came earlier. Those were the facts, and that was all disclosed. Uh, Twelve months came and went, and the money was not paid. And uh, my son, representing uh, our company, or my wife and I, sought recovery of the money. Came to a, a negotiation with the company. Some payments were made. Uh, regrettably, as is often the case in those circumstances, most were not. But it was everything was completely and utterly at arm's length, absolutely at arm's length. And uh, from our position vis-à-vis -vis the company, the honourable member should know that and the sort of innuendo he sought to raise is completely unworthy. The comparison, the comparison I might say, the comparison I might say with his unworthy with, and the reason I say it's unworthy is this, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, member for Fairfax, the member for Fairfax's position with respect to Queensland Nickel is that he at all times was in charge of Queensland Nickel. He ran that company, he was responsible for it. Uh, we had no management uh, involvement with the Revo company. Our position, our position was simply as an investor and then subsequently as a creditor. So our dealings were entirely at arm's length and in that sense his, his attempt to draw some contrast was, is completely improper and he, as a Queen's Counsel learned in the law, knows how improper it was. The member for Lyons. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question of substance is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer advise the House of the importance of a strong budget to support jobs and growth in our transitioning economy? Is the Treasurer aware of any threats to the rebalancing? in our economy from the mining boom, mining investment boom to a more diversified economy. The Treasurer has the call. And I thank the member for Lyons for his question. He's keen interest in the economy, not something which has been shown by those opposite who seem more interested in calendars today, Mr Speaker, than they do in the economy. Our economy, as the Prime Minister said, is transitioning successfully, 3 per cent real growth uh, to the end of last year, Mr Speaker, outstripping the advanced economies, most advanced economies of the world. This growth is delivering jobs, real jobs, some 300,000 in calendar year last year, Mr Speaker, the strongest jobs growth we have seen since 2000. 2006, when the coalition was previously in office, and this transition has been driven and backed in by the confidence of Australians, Mr. Speaker. They are the ones making this transition happen. Consumer confidence is up 11 per cent in the last six months, Mr. Speaker. 11 per cent, and confidence in the economic outlook over the next 12 months, Mr. Speaker, is up 20 per cent in the last six months. Successfully managing this transition is the key economic challenge facing our country, Mr. Speaker, economically, and it's the key challenge that the budget will be seeking to address later this year, Mr. Speaker. Now, that budget must continue to control spending, and it must provide uh, the right signals to promote investment, which will then drive, drive growth, which will then drive jobs, Mr. Speaker. And it's very important that the budget does control that expenditure, Mr Speaker. Those opposite are always happy to spend money that other people have earned, Mr Speaker. But on this side of the House, we know that every dollar that you spend in this budget must be fit for purpose, must do its job. And that's why we continue to have a strong uh, approach towards budget repair, towards fiscal consolidation that will see government expenditure as a share of the economy on my EFO fall to 25.3 per cent over the next four years, Mr Speaker. But those opposite have a very different plan. What their proposal is, Mr Speaker, is to increase spending beyond that which is currently occurring, because what we know is those opposite are already saying that they oppose $13 billion in savings that are before the parliament. They are voting against $13 billion, including billions of, their, of the own savings that they propose, Mr Speaker. They are opposing $13 billion in savings. On top of that, 
They have announced more than $11 billion in increased expenditure since the last budget alone, and there's some $35 billion of savings that they are letting the Australian people believe that they will reverse if they are elected to office. So before they even start, Mr. Speaker, they are some $60 billion behind the statement of my EFO last year. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the opposition now says that he thinks that uh, budget, re budget repair uh, cannot be an optional extra. Well, under the opposition, Mr. Speaker, it's not even an option, because what we see from them, Mr. Speaker, in their approach to budget repair, is they've come up with one billion dollars worth of savings to pay for sixty billion dollars worth of expenditure. They've come up with seven billion dollars of higher taxes, Mr. Speaker, because what we know from those opposite is they will tax and tax and tax because they want to spend and spend and spend. Tax and spend is no plan for jobs and growth. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I refer, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to his previous answer. Why, according to reports, did the Prime Minister cause an agreement to be reached to ensure that his private company would be repaid more than a million dollars before the workers employed by PlayUp received the $1.2 million in wages that they were owed. Members on my right will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister will be heard in silence. Mr. Speaker, I, the I believe I dealt with this in the, uh, my previous answer, but let me be quite clear. The, uh, while uh, my wife and I uh, invested in Revo, which was the Revo PDY Limited, which is a company that had the PlayUp uh, online uh, uh, site uh, application. Uh, at no time were we uh, responsible for or involved in the management of the company, nor did we have any insight into the management of the company other than such accounts as the company produced for the benefit of their shareholders and investors. So the responsibility for uh, paying uh, employees is obviously something that lies with the management of the company and the directors of the company, which we, we were not numbered among those people. We were out, very much uh, outside investors. As I, just to recap, uh, the investment was made in 2012. Right? Uh, the, when I became the communications minister in 2013, I disposed of a large number of investments with the objective of of ensuring that our portfolio was, as far as possible, contained, comprised, at least in terms of financial equity assets, of large managed funds. And that is, broadly speaking, uh, the position that it, it reached. So we sought to sell the shares in Revo. It's a private company. It needed the consent of the board to sell the shares. They proposed that the shares be sold to a associated company, Revo nominees, PDY Limited, uh, with the purchase price. So that was at their request. Uh, and their, their decision. Uh, I, would have, um, I would have preferred to have sold them to a third party, but it was a private company and we were in their hands in that respect. The uh, payment for the purchase price, as I said, was due in a year or when they did a capital raising. The payment was not uh, made after 12 months, and then in an entirely arm's length manner, our son Alex negotiated with the company to secure um, payment terms. Uh, which, were, which were then, which were then uh, uh, some of those payments were made, most of them were not. So at every level it was a completely arm's length transaction. Now there may well be criticism of the directors, there may well be criticism of uh, whether uh, an administrator should have been appointed sooner. All of those criticisms can be made, but they cannot be directed at external uh, creditors such as ourselves. And the honourable member knows this full well and his attempt to compare that to a business that is actually controlled by another honourable member here, or has been controlled by another honourable member here, is quite unworthy, and it is a very, very low and unworthy smear for someone so learned in the law as him. The member for Dobell has the call. Member for Dobell has the call. I members, heard, member thank for Charlton you, will cease interjecting. The member uh, for Dobell. Thank Let's you, start Mr. The clock Speaker. Again. The member for Dobell has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, representing the Minister for Employment. Will the minister outline to the House the importance of a productive building and construction sector to Australia's economy? 
What steps is the government taking to ensure that this sector continues to create jobs for Australians? And are there any obstacles to increasing the productivity of this vital sector into the future? The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Dobell for her question. And I can tell the member for Dobell that building and construction is Australia's third largest employer, accounting for almost a million jobs across our economy. And therefore, it's critical that it be as productive as possible. Regrettably, uh, in the productivity stakes, building and construction is a serious underperformer. In fact, in the December quarter last year, 68 per cent of all work days lost were in the construction sector. And in fact, in construction, there were 16.7 days per 1,000 workers lost, uh, compared to 1.8 workers days lost across all industries. That is an extraordinarily bad result, Mr. Speaker. 68 per cent of all work days lost were in the construction industry in the December quarter, and their average was 16.7 per thousand workers, compared to 1.8 for all industries. So building and construction is a laggard part of the economy, and we could do something about that right now by passing the Australian Building and Construction Commission Bill and the Registered Organisations Commission Bill, both of which the Labor Party continues to oppose, and we could put a tough cop on the industrial beat, Mr Speaker. But Labor will not do that. Instead, we get honeyed words from the Leader of the Opposition today down at the National Press Club, uh, honeyed words from a snake oil salesman about how he is in favour of full employment. But, Mr Speaker, who in this House is not in favour of full employment? Which member in this House is against full employment? Certainly not on anyone on this side of the House, Mr Speaker. I suppose the Leader of the Opposition is also in favour of world peace, because we're in favour of world peace too, and he's probably in favour of ensuring that every, there be no child living in poverty by a certain year, Mr Speaker, reminiscent of his hero Bob Hawke, who is no hero of him. In fact, he reminded me very much, Mr Speaker, of Dewey Finn in the School of Rock, played so admirably by Jack Black, when he was asked about his education philosophy. And he quoted that wonderful song by Whitney Houston, I believe the children are our future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside, Mr Speaker. I could sing it, Mr Speaker. I could sing it, Mr Speaker, but it would detract from the seriousness Please of the don't. House. This is the kind of pathetic, platitudinous rubbish we're getting from the Leader of the Opposition at the National Press Club today. If he wanted to show he was genuinely in favour of full employment, Mr Speaker, he would pass the ABCC and the ROC bill and do something about it, rather than talking about it, like this side of the House is doing, getting on with the job of jobs and growth. Just before I call the member for McMahon, the member for Hunter will cease interjecting, the member for Chisholm will cease interjecting. The member for Dobell, uh, in responding to an interjection, made an unparliamentary re remark. I'm going to ask her to withdraw that now. I withdraw. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Last year, the Treasurer was critical of Labor's tobacco excise increases, but today it's reported that the government is also considering an increase in the tobacco excise. Does the Treasurer still agree with himself? The Treasurer has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The um, member opposite seems to have caught the budget speculation bug, which is going around the place, Mr Speaker. It um, every he's, year. It happens every, every year. year. It happens every year, runs all the way up into May. Every year. And, uh, he has misquoted, Mr Speaker, um, what, the, uh, what the government has said about these issues. But what I have said about these issues, Mr Speaker, is, is those opposite are always looking for higher taxes because they cannot constrain themselves on spending, Mr Speaker. For Sydney. They're, they're the ones who always just cannot hold themselves back between Australians' pockets, Mr Speaker, and their ambitions for higher and higher spendings, Mr Speaker. And we had the Leader of the Opposition out there, as the, member for as the Minister for Industry was just reminding us, out there saying that he was going to achieve full employment. It reminded me of the member for Lilly, the four surpluses I announced tonight, Mr Speaker. The four surpluses I announced tonight, Mr Speaker. And I remember how all of those opposite 
They put it all in their newsletters and they sent it out far and wide, promising those surpluses, Mr Speaker. Now, this Member government is being very honest with the Australian people about where the budget is, Mr Speaker. Very honest. If you go to our MyEFA document last year, we are very candid. And we know the havoc they caused on the budget, Mr Speaker, will take many, many, many budgets of disciplined and determined action by those on this side of the House to control expenditure, Mr Speaker. And if they want to assist with that task, Mr Speaker, there are $13 billion of savings that they could pass, Mr Speaker, to ensure that the budget uh, could be brought towards balance, Mr Speaker. There's the ABCC bill, Mr Speaker, that they could pass today, Mr Speaker, which would ensure that we could improve productivity in the building industry, Mr Speaker. We could do that. We could do that, Mr. Speaker, if they wanted to support it. They could support other reforms, Mr. Speaker. Manager they could come out and back business. the changes we've made uh, to innovation, Mr. Speaker. They could back our proposals for multinational tax avoidance, Mr. Speaker, which they voted against in this place, Mr. Speaker. What we've seen from those opposite, Mr. Speaker, is one big fat no to every time we want to make savings. One big fat no to every single time we put forward positive structural reforms, Mr. Speaker, that will support jobs and growth. The member for Charlton will cease interjecting. The member for Leichhardt has the call. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the minister advise the House how the Defence White Paper and the Defence Industry Policy Statement will support the defence industry jobs in Northern Australia, including my electorate of Leichhardt? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question, and I acknowledge his advocacy on behalf of the 1,300 defence personnel who are based in his electorate. Mr. Speaker, the Australian government has announced the most comprehensive plan for the Australian Defence Force in living memory. We want to build the most capable and agile and powerful fighting force that we are able to establish and that will not only defend our people but defend our interests. And we are absolutely committed to increasing spending in defence to 2 per cent of GDP after it was slashed by Labor to the lowest level as a percentage of GDP since 1938. Mr Speaker, we are investing in new generation technologies. We want to grow a defence industry here in Australia that is able to create jobs while assisting in the defence of our country. Now, already 25,000 people are employed in defence industries. About 3,000 small to medium enterprises are involved in our defence industries. And it is not only prudent, but strategic and makes sense economically for us to enhance our homegrown defence industry. Mr. Speaker, our investment will be about $1.6 billion in boosting our local defence industry, $730 million for a new generation technologies fund, $640 million for a defence innovation hub, which is all about commercialising the strategic technological breakthroughs that our innovative, creative people are capable of. Mr. Speaker, in relation to Northern Australia, over the next 10 years, this government will be investing $14 billion to enhance and develop Northern Australia. And in the members electorate of Leichhardt, we will be upgrading facilities. We're purchasing 12 offshore patrol vessels to replace the Armadale class, and we're going to be developing HMAS Cairns. Now, this defence base is exceedingly important, and I'm told that for every dollar we invest in HMAS Cairns, $5 is generated in the Cairns community. Now, Trent Toomey, who is the chairman of Advanced Cairns, has said that this will be huge. Yeah. The government's investment in HMAS Cairns will be huge for the local economy. We are also upgrading Laverick Barracks in Herbert, uh, the RAAF Curtin and Learmont bases in Durack, and in the Northern Territory, investing about $8 million billion to increase facilities there. So we are improving our defence capability at the same time as building a homegrown defence industry that will generate more jobs, more opportunities for small to medium enterprises and support the development of Northern Australia. We are committed to ensuring that our defence force is capable, agile and protects our interests. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. It's reported today that the government is considering increasing the tobacco excise. But just two weeks ago, 
The former Prime Minister described this plan as a workers' tax that would slug smokers. Does the Prime Minister agree with the man he replaced, or will the government increase the tobacco excise? The members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for McMahon. I haven't called the Prime Minister yet. The member for Gorton, the member for Gorton and the member for McMahon are warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, I have to remind the Leader of the Opposition that uh, increasing tax on tobacco is not an original idea. In fact, I proposed it in my budget reply speech in 2009. Uh, so it's hardly uh, original. And one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the um, one of the uh, uh, aspects of tobacco, one of the aspects of tobacco taxes, of course, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, everybody agrees uh, that it's a tax that people should avoid by not smoking. And uh, indeed, the uh, reduction in the level of smoking is probably the single biggest public health success in terms of changing behaviour. But uh, having said that, Mr. Speaker, having said that, Mr. The Speaker, member as the for Treasurer Ballarat, observed, the member for we Ballarat are now in that annual fever, which of course builds up and up, of budget uh, budget speculation, and uh, we'll get lots of questions of this kind, essentially designed to find out what's in the budget. And all I can say to the honourable member opposite is that uh, he'll just have to wait until the budget, and, and then he will discover what uh, tax measures are contained within it. The member for Durack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Resources, Energy and Northern Australia. Will the minister update the House on the significance of first gas being produced at the Gorgon LNG facility in my electorate of Durack and the competitive edge that Australia's energy sector derives from innovation and new technology? The Minister for Resources, Energy and Northern Australia. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Durack for her question. And remember, the last time I took a question from the member for Durack, who has the largest electorate in the country, I said the Prime Minister's electorate could fit into Durack 53,000 times. Well, her electorate is so big that England could fit into Durack 12 times, Mr. Speaker. Now, one of the jewels, one of the jewels in Durack, is the Gorgon LNG facility on Barrow Island. And yesterday I had the pleasure to visit the LNG facility with the member for Durek, uh, the member for with the member for Groom, uh, with Senator Back and with the member for Brand, the Shadow Minister. And as the member for Durek said, uh, it has already started producing gas and soon will have its first shipment to Asia, uh, which will be in a matter of days. Now the Gorgon facility at seven, nearly $70 billion is Australia's largest ever private sector investment. And the figures are absolutely enormous. Some 10,000 people were employed on the Gorgon facility. 99% of that workforce was Australian. Nearly 1,000 local suppliers were used. The pipeline is more than 800 kilometres which would go from Melbourne to Adelaide. Uh, the ship, every shipment of gas from, uh, from Gorgon carries enough gas to fill a Japanese household uh, for one year. It is just an enormous project, and ASIL Allen Consulting has estimated over the life of the project it will provide some $70 billion worth of federal revenues and will add more than $400 billion to GDP. And, and Gorgon is just part of the golden age of gas in Australia, because by 2020 it will be one of ten projects that sees Australia overtake Qatar as the world's largest exporter of LNG. Now, Australia will face fierce competition for future markets, particularly from the United States, who, start to export, who which has started to export LNG. But what sets Australia apart from others is its innovation. Companies like Santos have merged with IBM, have worked with IBM on big data analytics. Woodside is using autonomous vehicles underwater. At Gorgon, they have the, the world's largest carbon capture and storage facility, which will reduce emissions by up to 40 per cent. And they have the largest subsea infrastructure that has ever been built. They've employed more than 1,000 engineers, and it shows that established industries like resources and energy can be at the forefront of innovation and technology. So while first gas from Gorgon may not be dis 
discussed at every Australian household table. It is something that we can be very proud of because it shows that we are using innovation the to advance Australia's time interests. Has expired. The member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Last year, when speaking about Labor's responsible plan on tobacco excise, the Health Minister said, and I quote, This is a grab for money. It's a political statement, and I don't like it. Mm. Does the Prime Minister agree with his Minister for Health? Is raising tobacco excise to levels recommended by the World Health Organisation a political statement or a grab for money? Mm. The member for Sydney's asked her question. We don't have supplementaries. The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, well, thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is, uh, it's, clearly, well, <laughs> it's clearly a revenue-raising measure, so I suppose in that sense it will generate revenue for the government. But it is the, the, arguments are, the arguments around tobacco taxes are very well understood. And, Mr. The Speaker, the, is I, I, understand, I understand the honourable member's interest in discerning what the contents of the budget is, but I can just, I can just remind the honourable member that every government, uh, I think governments of both political persuasions at different times have increased <laughs> tobacco taxes. As a leader of the opposition, I proposed it myself in 2009. And, uh, the, uh, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> but, the, uh, but I just say, so it's not a, it is not an original idea, and Mr Speaker, the honourable member, while I welcome her interest in the contents of the budget, we'll just have to wait until it's delivered. The member for Perth will cease interjecting. The member for Petrie has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister please update the House of the impact that the government's successful border protection policies have had on the number of children? in immigration detention? And will the minister also explain any alternative policies? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the member for Petrie uh, most sincerely for the question and for the interest he has uh, in these matters and making sure uh, that we can get kids out of detention, because nobody wants to see uh, anybody in detention, particularly children. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, I can report to the House today the number of children uh, in detention, uh, children that came off uh, boats that arrived uh, uh, to try and settle in this country, that number is now down to 34. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that is a significant achievement and yeah, yeah. I've repeated, uh, repeated to the House on a number of occasions, uh, Mr Speaker, that we want to get that number down to zero and I'm determined that we will get it down to zero because not only do we want to stop the boats, we want to make sure that we can get children out of detention as quickly as possible. Now, it hasn't always been this successful. Mr Speaker, in this country uh, in terms of border protection policy, because when the Labor Party was in government, uh, there were a couple of people who are sitting on the front bench now who are prominent ministers in the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years, who, if Mr Shorten was elected at the next election, would be prominent ministers in a shortened government. And I think it's important to point out a couple of the records uh, of members opposite. So the member for McMahon, member the member for Morton. McMahon, the shadow treasurer, who's now come up with this uh, disastrous negative gearing policy, which is going to drive down housing prices and drive rents up. He's, he's, the, he's the Chevy Chase of this parliament, let me tell you. Everything he touches turns to dirt. He is, he is the Clark Griswold. He's a Clark Griswold. He presides over every policy disaster, whether it's in government or opposition. He is a disaster. Let me read out. Let me read out his record. There were 25,000 people who arrived illegally by boat when he was the immigration minister. Almost 400 boats arrived on his watch. Over 4,000 children were taken into detention, and six detention centres had to open when he was the minister for immigration. Now, since uh, we've been in government, as I've said to this house before, we've had no successful boat arrivals since I've been the minister in this portfolio. We've had no deaths at sea. The number of children in detention, as I say, is now down to 34, bearing in mind that he wasn't solely responsible for the children in detention. 4,000 under his watch went into detention, but 8,000 in total went into detention. And they, for they presided over 17 new detention centres opening in total, and we have presided over 13 closing. Now, we have a very serious threat 
when the it comes to border Sydney protection, will cease because people smugglers are still putting people on boats. People still want to come to this country illegally, and this government has been absolutely resolute in our stance in relation to this area of public policy. That is, we are not going to allow people to drown at sea. We are not going to allow boats to restart. But if Mr Shorten is elected at the next election, rest assured that people the like the man coming to the dispatch box would the, the member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Last year, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the government has made it crystal clear that we have no interest in increasing taxes on superannuation now or in the future. Does the Treasurer stand by this remark? Will the Treasurer rule out making changes to superannuation which reduce the retirement incomes of low and middle income Australians? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you for, I thank the member for the question. If he was paying attention to my earlier answer, he would have noted that after the change of leadership last year, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister put the full review of retirement incomes back on the table. That was the new policy setting of the government, Mr Speaker. And the new policy setting of the government is to look at what is the purpose of superannuation and run that rule over every aspect of how superannuation arrangements are, are, are devised, Mr Speaker, to ensure that people who are at risk of being on a pension or on a part pension, they are the focus of where those incentives must go, Mr Speaker. So what we are doing is to ensure that superannuation is fit for purpose, just like we ensured that the pension would be fit for purpose. Now, those opposite oppose the savings measures and oppose the measures that made the pension more sustainable, Mr Speaker. And we'll wait to see, uh, once the government has finalised its, uh, its views on this matter, Mr Speaker, and these are announced at, at the latest in the budget, Mr Speaker, whether they are prepared to support the second phase of our retirement incomes review. But what we know on this side, Mr Speaker, is we've been dealing with these issues sensibly and methodically. We haven't run out there, Mr Speaker, with the sort of grab bag of policies, the headline grabbing stuff that the member for McMahon has done. As the Minister of Immigration has just reminded us, he is the architect of increasing capital gains tax by 50 per cent on investment in this country. He is the architect of, the, of, of, of a policy which does not just deal with existing housing, as we learned in this House when we last met, Mr Speaker. He is the architect of a policy which is going to say that if you want to invest in a commercial building, that you can't negative gear that either, Mr Speaker. Or if you want to invest in shares and you are going to use those practices, you can't do that. Or indeed, in, in some cases, in distributions from partnerships and, and sole trader arrangements, Mr Speaker. And that the capital gains tax changes don't just apply, Mr Speaker, to property, that they go right across the full bore of assets that are subject to capital gains tax, Mr Speaker. Now, this is the architect. This is the architect of a tax, Mr Speaker, and a tax change that is going to punish investment at a time in the transitioning of our economy when investment is the key thing we need, Mr Speaker. That's why those opposite cannot be trusted to manage the transitioning of our economy, which is going to continue to deliver great prosperity for Australians, Mr Speaker. They can't be trusted. They have learnt nothing in their time in opposition from their disasters in government. Absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, as a result, those on this side of the house, I think, can look forward to the budget, Mr. Speaker, with great promise. Because what that budget will do, Mr. Speaker, is it will focus on investment. It will focus on supporting Australians who are out there working and saving, investing every day, Mr. Speaker, who are making that transition happen. The member for North Sydney. My, my question is to the minister for the environment. Will the minister advise the House of what steps the government is taking to protect and open to the public foreshore land on Sydney Harbour, particularly at the former submarine base HMAS Platypus on Neutral Bay? What will be the benefits to the Sydney community of the government's approach? The Minister for the Environment. They never said that of you. <laughs> <laughs> Members, members will compose themselves. The ministers, the minister has the call. You're welcome at any time, my friend. Uh, look, I want to thank the uh, member for North Sydney. Uh, he has been a great champion of uh, cleaning up the platypus side of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, not just as the new member for Sydney, but when he was a councillor in North Sydney, for new member for North Sydney, uh, when he was a councillor for North Sydney and, in particular, when he was working as an adviser to uh, Senator Robert Hill, yeah. who at that stage had responsibility for establishing the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. And he was one of the architects 
one of the architects of this great monument to Sydney's history. It was an important role because uh, the previous, or the, the Labor government prior to the Howard government under uh, Prime Minister Keating, had wanted to sell a lot of that foreshore, and that decision was reversed under the Howard government, and it was taken forward. And what's happened under the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, with the support of not just the member for North Sydney, the former Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, who've all been advocates of its work, we've seen over $216 million invested. We've seen a dramatic clean-up of places such as Cockatoo Island, um, Platypus. We've seen Chowder Bay and the incredible restoration there, as well as the conversion of the uh, magnificent North Sydney area to sustainable public use forever. Now, against that background, what we've seen here is uh, $43 million, which has been allocated to clean up the former industrial and naval site, which is HMAS Platypus. That project is now almost overwhelmingly complete. The next great phase is to create one of Australia's great inner urban public parks. And that was announced uh, whilst the member for North Sydney was campaigning. It was his initiative, along with others within the community, he campaigned for, he advocated for, and he won that commitment from the federal government. So we will deliver a new public park as part of the uh, platypus cleanup for the people of North Sydney, for the people of Sydney, and for the people of Australia. There are very few new public parks which are created in inner city areas. This will be one. So the cleanup is now overwhelmingly done. The next phase is to move to the community consultation, community involvement, community design and community ownership and naming of this site. Uh, the member for North Sydney will help lead that process. He has delivered with it a $20 million contribution and commitment from the federal government. So, In a short time, he's already made a difference. In a long period, this government, over successive Incarnations has made a huge commitment to protecting and preserving Sydney's foreshore. I congratulate the, the new member. The has expired, and I call the member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Treasurer has today confirmed the government will make changes to superannuation concessions. Mm -hmm. But just two weeks ago, the former Prime Minister described changes to superannuation tax concessions and as, as I quote, a seniors' tax in the shape of more taxes on super. Does the Prime Minister agree with the man he replaced? Will the government make changes to superannuation concessions? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the honourable member, uh, his inquiry is, uh, is understandable, but he will have to wait until the budget to find out what is in it. And uh, the, uh, obviously, we will have a, the uh, budget. The budget speculation bug will continue to infect uh, the honourable member's opposite right up until budget night. But, Mr Speaker, one thing we don't have to wait for, of course, is the Labor Party's uh, uh, self-described positive plan to help housing affordability. This, uh, this, this, is a, this makes very significant changes to tax. Now, earlier in an answer to a question from the member for Sydney, uh, talk, we were talking about uh, tax on tobacco, and one of the reasons tobacco is taxed is to make it more expensive and the more you tax anything, the less likely people are to use it, because it's more expensive. That's the purpose of so-called sin taxes. Well, apparently the Labor Party thinks investment is a sin, because they are increasing uh, taxation on investment. They are, going to, they are going to increase capital gains tax by 50 per cent. So it's, and it is a signal example of the difference between the government's approach and the opposition's that this tomorrow we will be introducing into this House legislation which will provide a tax incentive for people to invest in start-up companies and, if they hold the investment for a substantial period, a capital gains tax exemption. Member so we are actually providing warm. tax relief for the express purpose of encouraging investment. What Labor is doing is proposing to increase tax, which will have inevitably the same consequence, it will discourage investment. You increase the tax on something, you'll get less of it. You lift the tax off, you'll get more of it. And that is, the, that is their approach. The rest of the honourable members 
housing affordability uh, project, of course, uh, res will result in house prices being reduced, new home buyers being squeezed out of, uh, of subdivisions, and the amount of rented property, that's to say, uh, tenant property available to tenants reducing over time uh, so that inevitably rents will go up. So house prices will come down, new home buyers will be squeezed out because when they go out to buy a home and land package in Camden or our outskirts of uh, Sydney or Melbourne, when they go out to do that, they will find that only they'll be crowded out by investors because that's the only asset class people will be able to negative gear. So they'll be crowded out and then elsewhere in the market in properties that are, that are, that are bought and built for tenants, the investor owners of that will only be able to sell them to home buyers. So inevitably, rental property will diminish and rents will go up. What an extraordinary bungled outcome by an opposition that does not understand the first thing about the property market. The member for Capricornia. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. I was delighted to host you recently on a visit to Rockhampton and talk about water infrastructure, namely the raising of Rookwood and Eden Ban weirs. These projects could create 2,100 new jobs as we suffer a downturn in coal. Prime Minister, could you update the House on what you got out of the trip and whether, whether the Commonwealth would consider this as a priority project for Queensland? And how far off is an announcement confirming whether Rookwood and Eden Ban Weirs have been successful? Members on my left, the Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the honourable member for a question. And uh, I, I enjoyed the visit to uh, to Rockhampton and the visit uh, to the site of the uh, of the Rookwood Weir uh, at Rookwood Crossing uh, with the with the Deputy Prime Minister. And the three of us shared a very co a common passion for water infrastructure. As uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has observed. Uh, you can make money out of mud, but you can't make it out of dust. Yeah. And water is the source of life. And, uh, and we, we recognise that the Fitzroy Basin, Fitzroy River Basin, is the second largest uh, water catchment in Australia, but with very limited amounts of regulation, weirs, dams, and so forth. So there is plenty of opportunity there. Now, turning to those specific projects that the honourable member mentioned, uh, the, the funding applications from the Queensland government, with whom we are working closely, are currently being reviewed by an independent technical panel, and, uh, which will report to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, next month. And can I just say, Mr, S Mr. Uh, Speaker, the, the innovation we found there in, in uh, North Queensland was remarkable, and going beyond the honourable member's uh, electorate to Bundaberg. Uh, we saw the, um, the Sweet Sensations Farm, an avocado and macadamia nut farm, started by two, two uh, young farmers from South Africa, uh, Craig Van Ruen and his wife. They came out to Australia, they got a block, they created a, uh, their horticultural operation there, uh, their orchard there, and of course the big challenge was, uh, was uh, flying foxes and birds, a huge issue, costing them 30 per cent of their crop. So what did they do? Smart people, smart people, technically uh, adept. They got the best advice, and they have developed these uh, most uh, impressive, uh, noisy, lights flashing drones, computerised drones that swoop out at night and chase the uh, flying foxes away. Uh, they've reduced the losses on their farm from 30 per cent to 5 per cent. What an outstanding uh, 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 accomplishment. And uh, the honourable member, of course, for Hinkler, uh, was there as well with us naturally in his election. Mr. Speaker, the Northern Australia is Australia's future. It is. It has got enormous resources, not least of which as the brilliant, enterprising people that live there. But the huge water resources, the huge potential for agriculture there, enhanced by by greater irrigation, is immense. And we are putting the dollars behind that vision. And we will see great investments in water in northern Australia that will enable us further to capitalise on the huge opportunities in East Asia as, the, as that becomes the centre of most of the world's middle class. 
The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer to his previous answer, in which he indicated that the government's tax policy would be announced on Budget Day. Previously, the government's position has been that there will be a tax statement in advance of the budget. Is the government's position now that the tax statement has been cancelled, along with the Green and White Paper on tax? The Prime Minister has the floor. Speaker, I, I thank the, uh, the honourable member for his uh, question and appreciate his curiosity in uh, the timing of government statements on tax, but I can assure him that all of the government's tax policy, uh, all of it, will be set out in full in the budget, and I look forward to him. I look forward to him. I look forward to him welcoming the budget, Mr. Speaker. And in the and I can say this, Mr. Speaker, that our budget, the budget that the Treasurer presents, will be one that will support growth and jobs and investment. The measures that he has announced already, the measures, the measures that the shadow treasurer has announced already, are absolutely calculated to reduce employment, reduce investment, and hold the economy back. They are, he is seeking to place an additional tax on investment. It is absolutely guaranteed to discourage investment. If you increase the tax on investment, if you increase the tax on investment, you will have less of it. That has to follow. He understands that, but he doesn't care. He thinks we can manage with less investment. Well, the honourable member should understand that what Australia needs now is more entrepreneurship, more investment, more employment. The so-called negative gearing policy of the Labor Party is absolutely calculated, absolutely calculated to stand in the way of entrepreneurship. Mr. Speaker, most small businesses in this country some of which become big ones, start off with one person's human capital and they get a job. They get a job and they've got that income and then they go and borrow some money and they invest and they take some risks. And it, goes, it does well. They can employ people. They can build up a business and it will create opportunities. But, Mr Speaker, under the Labor Party, that path to entrepreneurship is blocked because that, that that would be small businessman or woman will not be able to offset any losses on that investment against their income. They'll have to fund them out of their after tax income. Unless, of course, they've already got substantial investment income. So if you're wealthy enough to have lots of investments and you've got investment income, then you can do it. So who loses out? The young entrepreneur, the would-be entrepreneur, the small business person building on their human capital. And this from a party that claims to speak up for equality. Mr Speaker, the, gov the, the Labor Party's policy that they will implement if they come into government will increase rents, it will reduce house prices, it will undermine the growth of business and business formation. It is calculated to slow the economy down right at the time we ought to be encouraging its continued growth, which is what we, for our part, will continue to do. And on that note, Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister.